Um, yeah, so we've really evolved in our approach for family-centered care. We now have evidence-based practice, again, not heard of 25 years ago. They mentioned some of the new therapies that we were doing in those years, upper extremity training, strengthening fitness, body weight supported, treadmill training, huge advances in classifications, such as the GMFCS and the MAX and the other classifications, and objective and well-validated outcome measures. There's also been more recognition of lifespan approaches and of recognizing the issues of these children as they become adults. And we're also in the era where we're beginning to understand more and more about the mechanisms of activity-dependent plasticity. And when I first started as a therapist in the 1980s, there were actually very few treatment options for us to do. None were supported by evidence, and many were based basically on people's philosophical approaches mostly by individuals who came up with these creative ideas. But now we have evidence for many treatments, and they have positive, many treatments with positive mean effects, and we partly answer the question, which interventions are effective? But we still don't really have all the evidence we need. We don't really know for a certain goal which intervention may be best, and we really don't know well enough about what works best for whom, and I'll be focusing on that a lot today. We've all seen the, this article by Iona, Iona Novak and her colleagues, and just remind you the green lights means things we should be doing, we have plenty of evidence, and the red are the ones that we shouldn't be doing. So when we look at the two goal areas of improving motor activities or improving function and self-care, I drew a circle around all the physical and occupational strategies that actually can do those things, and we have very good evidence for, as well as drawing the circle around the physical and occupational therapy techniques at the bottom that we should not be doing, or below, <clears throat> excuse me, below the worth it line. In the middle are, are some other interventions that don't have enough evidence, um, or the evidence is inconsistent, but you also see things like orthopedic surgery and spasticity management. And the takeaway messages to me from those data are that interventions that are intensive, they require child effort or activity-based, they require engagement of the child or they're goal-directed, are the most effective. And the ones that reduce impairments, such as spasticity or range of motion, have some effects on other goals, but they don't directly affect function um, as dramatically as really the intense interventions. And obviously there are several treatments that we shouldn't be doing, but surprisingly as you travel around, they're still being used in many parts of the world. I think part of that is through lack of knowledge, but there also, I think, has been some active resistance to these as well. So just to try to illustrate, I'm, I'm going to show you two different children doing locomotor training. And I want you, if we just, we don't need randomized trials. We really just need to look at the children that we're working with. And we really can see very clearly, is the child working hard and are they engaged? Oh, jeez. So look at this child and, you, and tell me, or you think, is this child working hard? No. Is he, does he look engaged? Does he look interested, excited, motivated? No. So you, right away, you can probably, if you, you know, did this for months and months and months, with this level of effort and engagement, there's not going to be a change in this kid. Let's look at this different intervention. So just to show you, this, this is a little girl with her mobility before. So this child has bilateral spastic CP. She has delayed motor development. She has a diagnosis of CP. And she's not able to walk yet. So this same little girl, we, if, when we put her in a body weight um, supported harness that was computerized, so it's not supporting her. It's just slightly unweighting her to make it easier then she's moving around. Is she exerting effort? This is all, all child effort, all self-initiated effort. Is she engaged? In fact, yes. So she's really able to play and do things that she wasn't able to do before. And we wondered for, when we started this study whether children would tolerate being in the harness. As soon as they realized the freedom they had in that harness, they really wanted to, to do it. They would come and eagerly get in it to be able to play some more. So just to show you that that's, 
it's really easy to see, to look at interventions and judge them fairly quickly. The next question I want to ask is how effective, so we have things that are effective, but how effective are they? And as a researcher and a physical therapist, I worry that they're not effective enough. And I keep thinking there must be, there must be something better. Um, there, even though things do help improve function, it's, it's not as good as we would like. So we know that initially when we did studies that we were comparing things to, to either no, no control or standard of care, which isn't very intensive. So the intense therapies did better. And then when we started comparing across intense therapies, we found that, that they're not really superior to each other. And they're really, again, the, the ingredient there is really the intensity of the training. And even the, for treatments that are based on established principles, the effect sizes are often modest at best. And so why, why is that? So I'm going to talk about three major things. The first one is that the fact that our doses in training studies is often not large enough. The second is that our group means disguise this large variability in response that we see in our trials. And, so, and to, to talk about the need for personalized neural rehabilitation. And the third is that the intervention is not done early enough to take full advantage of neural recovery. So dose, I mean, I think if you really think about it, if we wanted to go train to, or learn a new sport or train for a marathon or, or start weightlifting program, would we really expect in a few weeks that we would be dramatically better or dramatically faster? And the answer is of course not, that these things that physical and motor skill training are very hard and they the benefits accumulate very slowly over time. So in our research studies, we try to minimize the amount of time to keep people in the studies, but they're, they're very short periods. And obviously in, in the clinic, you would, you would persist with these things. So we have to really think, do we stop our studies too soon? And the evidence that supports that is that if you look at the upper limb training, that when they had enough studies, they could start looking at the dose um, responses they realized that 60 hours at least was needed to have a clinically significant effect. And that for that effect to persist really needed to be more than 90 hours. So we went and reviewed the evidence for lower limb trials because obviously the, the lower limb evidence has not been as strong. And what we found there is that the doses in those trials ranged from 10 to 20 hours at most. So obviously in those trials, even if we had an effective intervention, we're probably not gonna get a response. The one study that um, has used higher doses in the lower limb shows very beautifully nice responses, and this is the, the study by Leyenhoft and colleagues that did intense bilateral training of both the arms and legs for, again, using the constraint model of using many more hours of intense practice. So we talked a lot about which therapies are the best, which type, and the dose. But what we really don't know enough about is the variability in response across patients. And so I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about that. And the reason why this is so important is at the end of the day, the whole reason we want evidence is from this definition by Sackett, is to make decisions about the care of individual patients. So can, can we really predict from a, a study, a randomized trial or any study, what each individual patient will respond? And, so I'm going to argue that we don't really have enough evidence to do this as well as we need to. And this is a quote from an article I read that's talking about this issue of individual variability in responses. And it says that the vast majority of published studies have emphasized main effects and group differences while paying little, if any, attention to individual differences. It needs to be recognized that contributions at the level of a group may not fully apply to each member of that group. And they showed this in their, um, in their paper, <clears throat> they showed some examples from some data. And I'm gonna start here at the very bottom of the white line, and it says, in this study, they had a mean effect of 0.04 meters per second in gait speed. And those of us who use gait speed as an outcome measure typically use 0.1 meters per second as an effective, clinically significant response. So when we think of a mean response, we think, Somehow in your mind, you kind of think that everybody had the, sort of the same response and they all got 0 .04 meters. And then there wouldn't have been effect. And then that, is that the end of the story? Well, they said, you know, there's many ways this could play out. You could have, if you go up the next level, you could actually have 50% of the group having a 0 .06 response um, and 50% having a lower than a 0 .02 response. Again, neither clinically significant 
either. But the other thing, the next one is really what you start to see, and this happens in many of our studies, that we actually had 40% of the patients had a positive response at 1.1 meters per second, and then 60% of them didn't. So there clearly were people that benefited from that intervention, and we, and it would not have shown in the, at the end of the day in the mean group effects. So I'm gonna show you two examples from my own research that was, I've been thinking about this for a long time because it was always very frustrating to me to see this variability and wondered what was I doing wrong that I couldn't get a more consistent effect. So I'm gonna start with my PhD thesis, is 1993, looking at the effects of quadricep strengthening on crouch gait. And for the young people in the audience, before we were strengthening, we were actually told never to strengthen because we make people more spastic. So I had 14 children, they did with bilateral CP, they did quadriceps progressive resistance exercise three times a week for six weeks. And we measured the outcomes at the level of body structures looking at hamstring strength. And, and then the, what I was trying to change at that point was knee crouch. I wanted these children to be more upright after strengthening. So this is our individual data that we got on quadriceps strength and you see a nice that everybody improved in strength, and, but there was a wide range in how much everybody improved, but that was significant at a group level. Um, and this is the, the data on knee crouch, which is really what was the, the aim of the study. And so this was also significant at a group level, but you see something very different here. You see that we had two children that really got a lot more extended. Most of the children had sort of a small increase in crouch, but we had people that got worse. And that's not something you want to do in your, in your treatments, is to have anybody get worse. So then here we are jumping ahead, you know, 25 years later, I'm doing another study, and this one was just published, and it's looking at alternatives to locomotor training um, in CP. And here we did 12 weeks of rapid resisted leg training, either on an elliptical or a computer assisted cycle, it was a motomed, where children, they, the computer started the movement and they had to basically overtake the machine. And trying to be more homogenous here. So I said, okay, this time we're not going to accept all comers. We're going to be really strict. All the children had to be born preterm. They all had to have PVL, and they were all had to be ambulatory. So what did we find? Well, the, the first outcome is what the way we tested did the we were really trying to train inner limb coordination. So we looked at the did they get faster on these devices um, when they did it voluntarily. And what we saw that they actually had huge increases in their cadence, both on the cycle and on the elliptical. Again, wide variability across children. So this just shows you an example of one of the girls on the elliptical um, at the start of the study. Again, there's no resistance on here. Her muscles are really fighting each other and really stiffening her up. And this is her after three months of training in her home with a device. So clearly you can see that these children, and as an example, she got a lot faster. But we really did this because we want children to be able to walk faster. We're trying to change coordination for walking. And so these are the mean effects. There's basically no change in the cycle group before and after in the mean group effect. And the elliptical, we saw a almost a clinically significant, but not statistically significant effect, and there were no group differences. So is that the end of the story? Should that be the end of the story? So this is the one girl you saw before. This is her walking um, before the study. And this is her walking after the study. So clearly, there is some people that had a positive effect. And these are our individual data for gait speed. And if you remember the previous picture on knee crouch, this looks just like that same picture. And what we see here is we have a bunch of kids over here that had very high effects. And as you can see here, the blue is the elliptical. Most of them were in the elliptical group. Few that had minor changes, not really, clini not clinically significant. And we had some children that got worse. And most of those children ended up being the cycle group. And since we measured a lot of different outcomes, what we did find is that the cycle actually increased or worsened their within limb coordination because they were using their ankle, they were using the limb very much as a unit in flexion and extension, whereas the elliptical lets you use your joints differently. So we think that was partly responsible, but even in the elliptical effect, there's still a big range in how these children did, even in a homogenous subgroup. So, you know, you start feeling pretty bad about your research, like why, why am I making people worse? Why are these things not working better? 
So I went to you know, look at the, looked at the literature for constraint. Constraints clearly are a big winner. It's the most, the biggest green bubble we have. It's the most effective treatment out there. When they did a consensus review of across studies, but what they found was the exact same thing, that they have some really high responders, they have this middle group that kind of changes, that pushes the mean positive. 25% of the kids in their trials actually are, have worse hand function after the trials. Now you think about this and you think, well, sometimes when you're learning new skills, it actually messes, if you've had a compensation, it may actually mess you up. So this is really interesting. So we're starting to realize that this is really happening in all our trials. Um, they tried to figure out why, you know, what are the reasons for this? Age is not related. Um, there's inconsistent studies. Some show that if you get really young, that that seems to make an effect. But, but you know, between the ages of 5 and 15, there's no, really no difference. Unlike stroke, your starting hand function has no effect on the outcome. And several people have published studies saying that how the brain had reorganized, whether you have more ipsilateral pathways, it seems to show some possibly worse effect. But this quote from um, the Gordon study or the paper was that the type of brain injury, again, is not as predictive as we had hoped. So this is really what happens. We have this group of children that we do something to. And interesting, Roz was talking about her differential responses, even in her group, and trying to understand this. And this is very much like if you give a medication to somebody. In this group of, of patients, you have a group that has a good outcome, and hopefully that those are more than um, the ones that don't. Then you have these ones that have the worst outcome and small improvement and the ones that have no change. So why is this? What are we missing here? So some of the things you're starting to realize is that there is individual variability, not in just how we respond to medications, but everything, everything that happens to us. Exercise has a very dramatic different effect on everybody. And before we used to think that these two words don't even belong together, genetics and CP, and it had been reported about 2% of the kids with CP or probably have some kind of genetic disorder. But this article um, by McIntyre that came out a few years ago basically says that 15 to 40% of kids with CP ha is associated with congenital malformations, suggesting that there is some genetic basis for many of these disorders. And then this um, wonderful article by Marina DeLuca talked about the fact that there's multiple genetic factors that interact with the environment to cause or modify the severity of CP, um, as well as other disorders, very much like they likened it to autism spectrum, where you have a genetic basis underlying that. So this is a big shock, you know, this is something very new to our field. And there's really little or no data in CP on the effect of genetic factors on responses to outcomes. In the same article I mentioned earlier by Buford, this is, talks about exercise as personal medicine. And this is a study that actually looked at responses to exercise in healthy adults, and they, they did these exercises exactly how they should be done. They, had, um, they did a target heart rate for aerobic training. They used progressive resistance exercise principles for strength training. And they looked at the response in this group, um, and what they found is that the change in VO2 max across the, the different adults was zero from zero after aerobic training for many months to 100%. Elbow flexor strength after 12 weeks varied from zero change to 250%. The, um, the muscle fiber change was zero after strength training, zero to 60%. And the response wasn't binary. It looked exactly like the data I've been showing you. There was a continuum where there is high responders and then everything in the middle. And they said that genetics is really one of the most likely factors for this. So that's physical training, but what about genetic variability in motor skill training? So this is a, a beautiful study done by Pearson Forup that came out a few years ago, and it looked at genetic variation in dopamine, which is, we, in the animal literature, there's well known to be associated with improved motor learning. And they looked at, what they did is they did a randomized clinical trial, again, on healthy adults, 50 healthy adults, the whole, both groups went through motor training for two weeks, motor skill training. One group got levodopa to upregulate the dopamine system, and another group got a placebo. And the hypothesis was that levodopa would improve motor learning. And there was no mean difference in this study. Again, but that, is that the end of the story here? Well, luckily, it's, it wasn't the end of the story. They actually decided to go and look at their gene scores. 
So they went and um, tested everyone for the, any of the genes that were related to dopamine transmission. And they found that those with higher scores did better when they were on the placebo because they already had plenty of dopamine. Those who had low gene scores did very well with the dopamine. So they've actually found an interaction. And it was a very strong interaction. So again, we're seeing here that there's variability in your genes of how you respond and how you learn motor skills. So this is really the first study. Um, this was published by the, the Karolinska and Hans Forsberg and his colleagues there. And what they decided to do is go back, since they had trained so many children with constraint-induced movement therapy for so many years, they, they asked these children to come back and they did genetic studies of those children. And they did the same thing where they uh, looked at their gene scores. And it's hard to see here, but what they did here is they correlated their responses after the constraint to the gene scores. And you see a nice linear, a moderate uh, correlation here. So again, this is really the first evidence that these children, when we saw that variability, that, that there was really a genetic reason for this. And it was probably, this has been the strongest factor of all the predictors that I mentioned before. So I wanted to just mention, so. Stroke, the stroke literature is actually um, realizing this. And in fact, there's, there's multiple trials now where they're giving levodopa um, for, during stroke recovery. And uh, this is a, sort of a new thing people are looking at. But one of the interesting things, oh, so actually shifting from there, now we're gonna shift to the idea that are we starting soon enough? So also in stroke recovery, what they've realized is that there's this proportional um, recovery rule and so if you, if you have a stroke, that you will recover basically 70% of the function that you lost, depending on your initial level, um, within three months. And that seems to happen. So it's a rule where it's, it's very predictable that this happens across patients. And it doesn't seem, interestingly, to be affected by the dose of therapy or the type of therapy they get within those months. Again, pretty shocking results for, you know, these, this is, a, again, a group that's been doing lots of training um, in chronic stroke as well as acute stroke. And the new data suggest in stroke that if you don't intervene at starting at five days post-stroke to three weeks, if you don't get into that window, you really can't change that, that trajectory. But if you do get in there and can, can work with those patients, that you can actually have a dramatic response above that 70%. So that brings us to CP, and this is why, as you know, we're, we're really starting to really push this idea of early detection and early intervention. So the critical periods for brain plasticity, what do we know? Well, we know that we have plasticity throughout our lifetime, but it's clearly far greater and fundamentally different in early development. And the, animal, the beautiful animal work by Freeland Martin, that they suggest from their kitten studies that there's three levels of plasticity in the motor system. The, the, one that, the window that closes the earliest is the spinal inner neurons. And if you don't get in there, they project in humans about three to six months of age, then, um, then you can't really recover brain function. Not reorganize, but recover brain function. But if you do, there's that possibility. So they've shown in their kitten model that early training, um, intense early training in those very early months actually recover the brain lesion. I mean, this is, these are phenomenal discoveries that somehow we need to be able to translate to our children. We also know that so the corticospinal tract is still maturing later, and that window is really up to two years of age. So Janie Yang in her studies was, was suggesting that at the very least we should get in there and do locomotor training within those first two years if children are delayed. Um, and, that we, and then what they found in their studies that the treadmill training results greatly exceeded anything that had been reported in older children. And this is a quote from that article that says, previous activity-based therapies may have been applied too late in development. And we know this, but this is a huge challenge for us to think of what, what can we do. There's multiple major international efforts now to try to di diagnose CP early. But again, the ethical issue we've talked about before is you can't diagnose and not offer somebody something that's going to be effective. And so that's a real challenge. It's a big challenge for our field. The animal data, um, this is work by Brian Kolbs, again, showed very much like the kitten model that on neonatal brain-injured rats, that if you encourage tactile stimulation after birth, they actually, again, recovered from their brain injury. Their brain lesion essentially went away. 
So again, there's, there's strong, this strong animal research that, that really is, is pushing us to look further. The, Kathy Morgan and her colleagues did do an intervention where they started at three months of age, very intensive intervention uh, compared to the standard of care. And they showed that, that more is better and that they, they did get some positive effects from their trial. They were working with coaching families and even coaching siblings to play and, and to provide more enriched environments for their children. Um, and do this, it was something that was done every day in the homes. But clearly we need more effective strategies. So those are just some thoughts I wanted to share with you. And I, just to, to give some conclusions here, that obviously interventions that must address specific functional goals of the child and family, they have to follow the basic principles of conditioning and motor learning. They have to have the effort and engagement, and they have to be of sufficient duration. We clearly want to only choose treatments that have best evidence, but we have to really be careful, and, be, and we're in, a, in research or in clinical practice, we have to monitor whether our patients are responding to it or not, and clearly we want to know if they're getting worse. So we really need to be to realize that these are, none of these are one size fits all, and everybody is going to be different. And you may have to come up with other strategies for the ones that are the poorer responders. And then the final thing is trying to start sooner. Um, I just saw this quote and I love it. It's, if we can change the beginning of the story, we can change the whole story. So thank you very much.